Welcome to using Python's Rays for Effective Exceptions. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course introduces you to exceptions, a language feature most commonly used for error handling, and the Rays keyword that causes an exception to fire off. In this course, you'll learn about exception objects, what it means to raise an exception, the exceptions that come with Python, how to write your own exception classes, how to chain exceptions together, and the relatively new language feature, exception groups. The code in this course was tested using Python 3.12. Most of the code will work in any Python 3, except, see what I did there, for exception groups and the add note feature, both of which were added in Python 3.11. Those will be pointed out as I go along. Exceptions are a key part to how code flow happens in Python. Their purpose is to cause a code block to be interrupted. Their most common use is error handling. If something goes wrong in a code block, an exception gets raised to signal an interruption. The control flow in the block is stopped and then resumes inside of a handling block. This is why exceptions mostly get used for error handling. It allows you to take action immediately after an error without needing to write error checking code after every single statement in a block. The exceptions that your handling code deals with might be from libraries, or you can write your own exceptions as well. By the end of this course, you'll have seen several examples of how exceptions get used, the various ways of using the raise keyword, and some of the newer exception features added in Python as of 3.11. All right, that's the gist. Next up, let's dive into the exception object. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll be covering the exception class and how to use exception objects. Exceptions interrupt the flow of code execution. They mostly get used for error handling, but Python also uses them for other things as well. When you iterate over an iterable, Using the for keyword, a stop iteration exception is what tells the for loop that the iteration is complete. There are also exceptions that are informational, such as those used with the warn function to inform programmers about deprecations. These don't get raised like regular exceptions, but the classes themselves are still part of the exception hierarchy. In programming, there are two general styles when dealing with error information for a line of code. Look before you leap means a piece of code, say a function call, returns a value indicating its success or failure. After each line of code, it's the programmer's responsibility to check the error flag. It isn't uncommon for the success indicator to just be ignored by the programmer and fingers get crossed hoping the code continues to work. By contrast, the easier to ask forgiveness than permission style is what exceptions are for. You write a block of code, let the code run, and if something goes wrong, the programming language invokes an associated error handler instead. This way, you can group multiple lines together and not have to worry about checking every single line at a time. In Python, the easier to ask forgiveness style is achieved through the use of a try except block set. If something goes wrong within the try block, the code raises an exception and Python transfers the code flow into the accept block. Note that many languages use the terminology throw and catch for exceptions. Python instead uses raises and handles. As Python isn't my first programming language, you might catch me using the wrong phrase. S see what I did there? I'm just going to keep pointing out the bad dad jokes just in case they're coming too fast for you. Enough blah to blah. Let's write some code. I'm inside my trusty REPL here. Uh, let me start by creating a list. Not a fancy list, but it's a list. I access an item in the list using sequence notation. That's those square brackets. Remember, Python is zero indexed. Names two returns the third item in the list. What happens if I try an index bigger than that? And as you might have guessed, given the title of the course, you get an exception. Notice what this looks like. 
let's start at the bottom of the output and work our way backwards. The highlighted index error is the exception that got raised. Python's a bit messy when it comes to exceptions. It names most of them errors. I suspect that's to save typing, but the term exception is common in a lot of languages, so making it raising an error would have caused more confusion than it was worth. So what you've got here is the state of things. Most exceptions are named error. Go figure. Index error is one of the exceptions built into the Python standard library. It gets invoked in exactly this case, when you use square brackets to reference something outside the size of a sequence. In this case, I'm asking for item index 3, that's the fourth thing, in a list with only three things in it. Next to the index error is a message. The message is actually an argument to the index error when it gets created. And when you raise your own exceptions, you can set the contents of this message. Its purpose is a bit like logging. It adds some more information so that the person seeing the exception has a better idea as to what caused it. Above the index error line is what's called a traceback. A traceback shows you what things got called in what order when the exception was raised. In this case, since I'm using the REPL, it only has one thing in it, a single line from standard input. If I had a function that called a function that raised an exception, you'd get one line in the stack for each. A traceback gives you not only the exact place in your code where the exception was raised, but also who called the code to get to that state. All right, let's add some error handling now. A try block contains the code you want to run that might raise an exception. Here, I'm putting in the same problematic reference as before. And then the accept block contains the handler. The code in this block is what gets run if the try raises an exception. Spoiler alert, it will. The accept keyword takes an optional argument, the kind of exception that this block is willing to handle. Here, I've used index error. If I hadn't put it, the block would catch all exceptions. Because I do have it, if the code raises a different kind of error, the handler won't get called. Inside the accept block is where you put your error handling code. Often this means writing something more informative to the user, and for me, in this case, I've printed something out. Okay, let's let this run. The end result is that final print statement. The call to names three raises an index error, gets caught by the handler, and then inside the handler, print is called. And that's what writes your list doesn't have that index to the screen. So exactly what happens when names three gets run? Well, Python underneath the covers is raising an index error. There's nothing magical about that. You can do it yourself. The raise keyword takes an instance of an exception class and then raises that exception. Note that because I didn't include a message as an argument to the class, the bottom line here only shows the error itself. Otherwise, the input pretty much looks just like the uncaught version above. Let me do it again, adding a message. And there you go. Exceptions are a class hierarchy. The index error exception inherits from the exception exception. Here, I raised the general class itself, this time including a message. It's not good practice to do this. You want to use an exception class that maps to the kind of thing that went wrong rather than using a generic one. And I'll talk a little more about that in a future lesson. Exceptions accept multiple arguments to the constructor. You've seen the message, but I can put more than that if I wish. except for the fact that you can raise them, exception objects are, well, just objects. Like I've done here, you can construct one and use it later. Since I only stored it away and I didn't raise it, there's no trace back here. All I'm doing is holding on to it for now. The args attribute of an exception contains the arguments passed into the constructor. This means you can get at the message or anything else the object was constructed with when you're handling the exception. I'll cover more on this later as well.
since I've got it tucked away in a variable, I can raise the variable. You don't tend to do this often, but it can be handy if you want to do something like write a function that returns exception objects that you can raise later, in case you're trying to do something complicated. Remember, everything in Python is an object, even the exceptions. The try except block has one more optional part called finally. Sometimes you want some code to run even if an exception is raised. That's what the finally block is for. Say you opened a connection to the network and then something went wrong before you closed it. You want to make sure the closed method gets called. You do that in a finally block. I'm not going to muck around with network connections, but you can see from this code that the first print should run and the second shouldn't. Now I'm inside the exception handler, printing a little more info, and this is a finally block. I'll put a print in here as well. Remember, this print will get called whether or not there's an exception. Let's try this out. Again, with the dad jokes, this topic just kind of begs for it. And there you go. The first print gets called. The second doesn't due to raising a type error. The third print is called inside the exception handler. And finally, the finally block is invoked. That finally print would happen even if I hadn't raised a type error in the try. You've already seen how you can add a message argument to an exception. Well, there's a convention for the format of those messages. It should start with a lowercase letter, and it should not finish with a period. The world won't end if you ignore this, but doing so keeps your messages consistent with how those coming from Python look, and consistency's good. Okay, that's the basics of the exception object. Next up, let's take a look at some of the exceptions that come with Python. In the previous lesson, I showed you how to raise and handle an exception. In this lesson, I'll be talking about some of the exceptions that come with Python. Python is exceptional. I, I told you I'd keep it up. In fact, it's so exceptional, it has over 60 built-in exceptions. This link shows the documentation where you'll find them all listed. In the previous lesson, I mentioned that exceptions inherit from an object hierarchy. The root of that hierarchy is the base exception class. And the topmost one you should use is the exception class itself. This is the one I showed you in the previous lesson. That being said, you probably shouldn't use this one either. It's a little too generic. Let's talk about the eight most common exceptions you're likely to run into in Python code. Import error gets raised if the import statement can't load a module. If you've coded at all, you've likely seen the name error. This one gets raised if you reference something that isn't in the local or global scope. This one could also be called spelling error, as misspelling a variable is the most common cause. At least for me, that is. The attribute error gets raised if you reference an attribute that doesn't exist on an object. It can be a bit more technical than that, as Python has several things you can do to override attribute behavior, but the typical case is trying to use an attribute that isn't there. An index error gets raised when you attempt to use an index in a sequence that's out of range of that sequence. That got covered in the previous lesson as well. The key errors kind of like the index error, but for dictionaries, this gets raised if you try to reference a non-existing key. Zero division error gets raised if you attempt to divide a number by zero or try to do modulo zero. Mathematicians get pretty cranky when you try to do this. Python just raises an exception. A type error gets raised when you try to do something that isn't compatible with an object's type. For example, if you attempt to divide a string by an integer, you get a type error as strings don't support division. Value error is probably one of the ones I see and use the most. This is a bit of a catch-all for things where the type of the argument is correct, but the value is unsupported. Say you had a function that was supposed to take strings with only vowels in them. You might raise a value error if the string passed in contained consonants. It's still a string in both cases, so it isn't a type error. But if the function's expecting only vowels, 
and find something else, a value error is the appropriate thing to raise. Although these exceptions all come with Python, Python's not the only thing that should raise them. You can as well. In fact, using existing exceptions is encouraged as they fit a pattern that other programmers expect. Let me show you an example. I'm going to write a function that takes a list or tuple of numbers and returns a list with the squares of each value of the inputs. Here, I'm checking if the numbers argument is a list or a tuple. And if the function doesn't get a list or a tuple, it raises a type error. This is actually a perfect example of what type errors are for. I've included a hint in the message body as well, so a programmer seeing it will know why I've raised the exception. If this were a program, rather than me just futzing about in the REPL, I'd have a doc string for the function, and in that doc string, I'd indicate that this function raises type error and why. You should always document your code. With the type checking out of the way, this line does the actual work. It's a list comprehension that creates a list of squared values based on the iterable input. Let me run it. And there you go, some squares. Instead of passing in a list, let me pass in a set. And as expected, it raises a type error. A couple things to notice about this exception. First, because it happened inside of a function, there are two lines in the traceback. The stack shows line 3 and line 1. Line 3 is relative to the function declaration, and it's on the third line of that function where the exception gets raised. Line 1 is relative to the REPL, and hence the angle brackets module notation like you saw in the previous lesson where I raised exceptions from the REPL line itself. The second thing to note is that this is a bit of a contrived example. Don't get me wrong, you should raise a type error if an iterable without numbers gets passed in, but sets are actually iterable. Uh, if my code were a little better, I would do type checking to include sets and allow them, but that wouldn't give me as good an example. Now that you've seen some of the exceptions that come with Python, it's time to see how you can write your own. That's up next.